Hi, my name is Diana and I'm doing a tutorial today for uh, beginners who are wanting to do performances and or uh, also uh, both as vocalists and as maybe Native American flute players and maybe I'll throw in a few little hints for keyboard players as well since I do a little bit of that. So um, I recently did a little short workshop for a group, uh, online flute group, so I thought I'd go ahead and share the same uh, information here on YouTube. So um, I've been singing and performing since probably, I don't know, since I was probably second grade. And I've always had that, um, that desire to entertain other people and that's what uh, performance is. And so I've done a little bit of everything. I've, uh, you know, played an instrument, I played flute, I played recorder. Uh, but I have to say my forte is actually, I've been uh, singing a lot and I'm a vocalist, so I've been singing professionally probably since, I think, probably since I was uh, graduated from high school. Um, and so I've been in a lot of different environments and settings. Um, I uh, have sung, like I said, uh, in talent shows, but I also got one of my first uh, performances where I actually got paid was uh, singing for a, a wedding. And then I sang for, um, I sang for some funerals, yay. But, um, and then I've done big performances as well. I've sung solos for, you know, huge cre uh, gr crowds. Um, you know, I remember I used to sing also for the, um, for the Masons. And so I used to do a lot of their stuff. And again, any of these tips I'm sharing can go for, you know, a vocalist or someone who plays Native American flute. All of these settings are viable and workable with the Native American flute as well. I've also sung at various churches. I used to um, sing at, you know, a Catholic church, which was a very, very structured format. Again, the flute could probably be worked into that as well. Um, I've sung for homeless people, you know, when we've had groups into some of the other churches that I've sung at, you know, where we had them come in. And, and so I've, you know, for sung for that. I've sung with groups, I've sung with bands, I've sung, uh, you know, in a big stadium once, I got to sing the national anthem for uh, Sacramento River Cats, gay River Cats. Um, and uh, I've also sung like at Unity Churches, which are also very, very, uh, they lend themselves very well to instrumentalists, especially Native American flute players. Um, and right now what I've been doing for the last 11 years is I actually, I found my niche, I think. I found, uh, and it's a great niche also for Native American flute players as well, is um, singing and, or playing for uh, seniors, citizens, or um, retirement communities. I play at memory care centers. I'm hoping to start playing maybe for some hospice care facilities as well. But I've been doing that for about 11 years and that's actually my calling is, is playing there. And so that's how I kind of gravitated a little more towards the Native American flute um, is a, a little more mellow uh, locations and it's so much easier to carry things around so just thought I'd share that background with you um, so what I'd like to go over real quick are I've got four six actually six points that I'd like to share in regards to um, things to think about when you perform and actually this video is actually geared for uh, beginning performers and performers who are kind of on a budget. Uh, I found myself, you know, uh, I don't have a big budget. And so that's one of the things I think uh, keeps a lot of performers from putting themselves out there. And what I find is you don't have to spend a ton of money. And I've been, like I said, I've been doing this for quite some time and I've been getting paid for it. So I must be doing something right. So um, I'm gonna share these tips. So here we go. Six things to think about when, excuse me, when you are uh, performing. First one, and I'm going to go over all six first, know your audience, know your venue and your setting, have the right equipment and have a checklist. Uh, number four, prepare your music and we'll go into that. That might have to be a separate uh, video. Uh, expect the unexpected. I have seen the good, the awesome, the bad and the ugly. So that's something we're going to talk about as well. And number six is take care of business. And now I'm going to kind of go into the business end of things as well real quickly. And again, I may do a, a, a separate video for that. So we'll see how long this goes. So I'm going to go quickly through those six, six steps. To, and basically, I'm just going to kind of pose questions and situations to think about when you're performing and when you want to be on budget and 
my big thing too is I prefer to work smarter, not harder. So let's go with uh, the topic of knowing your audience. Um, you know, it, it really is going to affect your music choice and your equipment choice when you take that into consideration. So for instance, I have played, like I said, I have played for small crowds. I've played at a you know, cemetery for one and three, three people once. Obviously, you know, I'm not going to play hard rock music for that venue or for that type of a crowd. Um, also, you have to take into effect, you know, how many, you know, so three, or you could be playing for a small group of 10. I sing for a group of about that size at a memory care home. Again, my audience is small. And they're also, their sense of cognition isn't that great. So I have to really tailor my music to that audience and think about what's going to work for that audience. Um, again, here, I sung for some, you know, I've sung for some homeless, I, I think there was like a group of 50, 50, 60 of them. Uh, you know, I'm not going to do rap, uh, you know, and it was in a church setting. So, you know, take your setting and your audience into, con into consideration for that. Um, Another thing is, are, are they, you know, if you're in a bar, uh, you know, what kind of genre music do you think they're going to like? If you're in a cowboy bar and are you going to play some Barbra Streisand type stuff or, you know, that's not going to work. Will it lend itself to a vocalist? Yes. Will it lend itself to a Native American flute player? Maybe not so much. And in regards to that too, is uh, in regards to knowing your target audience and your setting, um, you know, uh, take that into consideration. You know, are the people that are going to be listening to your music, are they people who you think are like diehard uh, Native American foot players? Or are they, you know, what, what kind of music do you think they're gonna like? And I know we have to play to our heart, but it's really important to take the audience into consideration. Again, that's a mutual respect of the art. Um, same with like when I sing at uh, senior homes, you know, I, um, my audience there has some, you know, hearing faculties, you know, their hearing issues, uh, sight issues. Uh, I'm going to have to, you know, pick, you know, in regards to my sound equipment, I'm going to bring the right sound equipment for that audience. But at the same time, I don't want to blast them. If I do like, let's say a hospice, Knowing that I'm playing for someone who, again, my audience is someone who's not feeling well, may not be hearing well. Uh, but if I'm like in a one-on-one -on -one situation with this person, I'm going to bring something that's a little bit lower, a little more intimate, um, you know, and, and not play hard rock music or something like that. So again, that's where it's really important to know who your audience is. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Uh, what else? Oh, church. Again. If you're going singing to a church, and every church is different. I've been to like 15 different churches, and every church setting is different. Know your audience. You know, I've been in a church for wedding, a little more uplifting, you know. Uh, and I have to cater to the family whose, you know, celebration I'm, I'm assisting in. Um, funerals, again, you know, if you're in a Catholic church setting... There's only certain songs you can play. I don't know if you know that, but there's definitely liturgical uh, rules that you have to follow. So, you know, again, know your audience and your setting. Uh, I've sung it, uh, sung and, and just recently played at some unity churches. They're a little, you know, they're more into the, you know, uh, metaphysical stuff. They're into the woo-woo stuff. And so the Native American flute is going to be more than welcomed in that, in that, um, environment and so i'm just throwing things out you know what what to consider and what to take into consideration when you're um you're playing your music so again that's your audience and i'm just throwing that out to you um i'm trying to think if there's anything else i've kind of gone through i think those are kind of the main ones i have dealt with uh if you're in a big crowd and then this one if you're in a big crowd you know are they going to be listening to your sitting to your music and are they there for you? Is that audience there for you? What is the age limit? If you've got young kids, are you going to want to uh, sing something that has swear words or, you know, and also with Native American flute music, how much of that music are they going to be able to listen to and sit through? So that's something to think about, you know, so, all right, I'm going to throw those things out to you. I'm sure there's a lot more, but I'm just sharing what I've been through. And again, you can take it or leave it. 
hopefully you grab nuggets of information that are helpful and whatever doesn't resonate with you, let it drop. Um, point number two, know your venue. And when I say know your venue, uh, I guess I also again tie them with setting. Things you need to remember. I mean, uh, are you going to, let's say, a festival where you're going to do some kind of a flute solo or sing a solo? Are they going to have, you know, um, are they going to consider consider if they're going to have their own sound system? Uh, you know, and and who's going to be in charge of that sound system? Are you doing your own sound checking or are they? You know, so that's again getting to know your venue. Um, the most basic thing about knowing your venue is, um, you know, make sure you have a contact person. Uh, I sing, like I said, I've sung at churches and I need to make sure, you know, I kind of have an idea as to whether or not they have a power source. Uh, am I going to have to bring equipment that, you know, uh, is going to need to be its own power source? Um, you know, how far is the, am I going to have to use an extension cord? Uh, how many outlets do they have? That type of thing. The lighting, that's another thing, you know, uh, in regards to that ambiance is, you know, are they going to turn the lights out in the middle of, of you singing? Uh, you know, that has been an issue for me too, where I've had to make sure I have my own little light. Um, basic things, do, is there air conditioning? Is there heating? Uh, is there a restroom close by? Uh, you know, how many stories is it? Uh, make sure you know the time and the location precisely. Those are huge. Those are huge. If you want to be ever called back to play, you make sure you know those things. Sometimes I even call the day before or the morning of to make sure that they're waiting for me and that they're expecting me because nothing's worse than lugging all of your equipment into your car and into this building and finding out, oh, sorry, well, we had issues and we're going to have to cancel your performance. And that works two ways too. If you're not able to uh, make it to a performance, you make sure you call those people and let them know that you can't come and or offer another date if possible. Um, what else uh, have I come across? Um, oh, you know, again, the power thing is huge. Uh, I'm trying to think what else. Um, yeah, I mean, those are just things I ask myself all the time. Oh, you know, also, what kind of equipment do they have for you? Uh, important. I found this out the hard way too, is do they have tables for your set? What kind of things do they have for your sound equipment? Um, are, is that, are you going to be singing in a small room? Are you going to be singing in a big room? Do you know the exact location of the room that you're going to be singing in? I've gotten lost on occasion and had to start, I started late my performance because I didn't realize which department I was going to be singing in, especially like in a nursing care home that's got four stories. So always make sure to double check those things. Um, and even the power outlets, make sure those outlets are working. I've had that happen as well, where the power outlets were not working and I had to find something else. And, and we'll talk about equipment because that's why I kind of switched to rechargeable equipment for that very reason. A park. If you're playing in a park, don't assume there's going to be power. That's another thing I learned the hard way. Uh, if you're singing in a park uh, setting, you know, make sure that they've got what you need. Or if you're going to be singing on a street corner or something, you're going to have to be self-sufficient. So all of those things are, are really important. So I just wanted to share those things and things to consider in that department and knowing your venue and your, and your settings there. Um, Let's see what else. Let's go ahead and move on to the next item. So the next item was have the right equipment. And I have a checklist, which I kind of memorize it because I, I do perform anywhere from three to five times a month, but they're all kind of different. Um, but I, I have learned for me, um, and especially if you're a beginner, I started out with a pretty, uh, I have what's called a pile uh and I'll, I'll put some documents um, and list of my equipment. But this is a pile, uh, actually a karaoke system. And that pile karaoke system, I think, cost me 150 bucks. And that, I loved it because I was starting, I did some uh, concerts out in the park. And I could, it's got, you know, plenty of um, inputs for music, but it's Bluetooth. And I really enjoyed that. And it's got a pretty decent sound and it's also got an out jack. Um, so 
that is great for you know uh, outdoor venues and it's worked well for me I bought a little uh, stand from Amazon Amazon basics and that really works well um, and if you don't feel comfortable using Bluetooth it does have the auxiliary in puts as well so that I really liked that um, and I'll do a separate video just on the equipment um, same like for your venue if you're going to be singing let's say for a uh, some kind of a you know hospice setting I use this little thing and again I'll have the links and this is just a teeny tiny speaker especially if you're playing Native American flute um, you know I, I use this little thing it cost me 15 bucks on Amazon it even comes with a little case and it's got a little hook so if you want to put it around your belt, you can. And this is great for intimate um, performances. If you're going to be singing just one-on-one, -on -one, or even like if I had played my, nat my uh, Native American flute at that gravesite, um, you know, uh, uh, event, I mean, I could have used that because there's only a couple of people there. Um, and that was 15 bucks, I think. So super easy. And you won't get the reverb on your flute or your voice, but, you know, in that setting, probably the raw sound is going to be uh, felt more and it's going to mean more to those people. Um, I've also learned to work harder, not smarter. That thing does get a little heavy. It's not super heavy, like some of those Bose speakers, and that's why I bought this. Um, but I, I, I had to uh, kind of downgrade because I had some back issues. So I kind of downgraded in, in regards to the speaker. So I've got this, this speaker here. And I don't know if you can tell what it is, but it's an ion speaker that I bought. And so that works really well and it fits into my little toolbox as well. I don't know if you can see that, my Husky toolbox. Again, I'm thinking budget and how much stuff do I need to carry around. Um, again, I sing at more intimate um, venues, so I don't need anything super huge. But I, you know, all of this can interact with each other in some way, shape, form, especially with that unit if you need more sound. Um, let's see. So that was like $89. And so between this one and I have a little $29, uh, billboard karaoke machine here too, that works great for flutes and vocals and back, um, backing tracks has Bluetooth. That's what you want to look for. At least that's what I, I do because I don't want, want to be fiddling around with chords. Um, and we'll talk about what can go wrong with that though too. And then I have a cube one that I actually started off with. I don't know if you can see that it's at the bottom of this one right here. That was actually one of my first ones when I was playing um, just my piano. But you also need it electric. It's completely electric driven. Um, and there's no Bluetooth. So that's why I kind of moved up to these other ones. What I also have is this pile. Um, it's called a wireless karaoke microphone mixer. And actually this pile over here also came with a wireless microphone. Um, and I really like it because it has uh, two microphones for the wireless and it comes in with two uh, microphone jacks that you can use two wired microphones for along with the wireless. And the thing that works the best is also that I can use my um, echo. It has an echo feature on there for flutes. So really, and again, I think that was $99. So, and this is all very, pretty much everything here fits into this Husky little um, toolbox that I got at uh, Home Depot. Uh, again, I don't like to carry a lot of stuff. So real quick, I'm gonna go through this. This is just a real light uh, microphone, I mean, sorry, uh, music stand. And I'll have the link to this. I love this because it folds up and I put this microphone stand along with, I'm sorry, music stand along with this microphone stand and I have the link for this. This is super easy to carry. I love this microphone stand because it is, um, it completely folds down and it bends forward and backwards. It's got a nice little tripod, pretty sturdy, and it's thin enough where I can actually put my, um, my little tablet holder. This is my tablet holder that I like, actually my son gave it to me. And you can find similar ones. Again, I'll put a link to some that are similar to this, but I use it for my tablet. And it's great. I mean, it lends itself to where I can just, you know, if I need, I use this for my backing tracks, but because I also do karaoke and I have to read some music as well, I use, I use both. So I know some of you may not want to use both, and maybe you have that little scrolling feature on your tablets. 
but I do use both uh, because sometimes I do still have to cheat and read my uh, tablatures for my Native American flute. So, um, and then I have my Native American flute holder that again, I uh, have right here. I don't know if you can really see that, but I bought that on, um, on Etsy. And also while I'm talking about this really quickly is I also have a folding chair. So if you see, notice that folding chair is probably not the most sturdiest thing to put your stuff on, but I have a folding chair because I, again, if you don't know your venue or you have to have something to put either your speaker on or your flutes on, I carry that and I actually wrap it. Uh, I, I, by the way, that speaker also fits into that Husky bag, but I put all of this into that Husky bag and then I fold my tape, my chair, and I'm able to um, set it on top and, and clip it with a bungee cord to the, uh, to the handle. So that's awesome. So I, I carry everything in that little Husky uh, toolbox and I'm not breaking my back doing it or breaking, the, breaking my bank. I don't spend too, too much money on that and I got it already set to go. And then there's my flute bag that I really love that I also got on Etsy. So real quick on that, on my equipment, I also do have a checklist and I will go ahead and share that with you as well. Um, I'll have that, I'll have that as uh, an attachment and as a link that you can hopefully access that with. Um, but I'm, I'll go over it real quick with you. So this is my checklist and something to think about. I'm just throwing it out there for you uh, to think about. But um, like, for instance, when I'm performing, and again, I perform both as a vocalist and as a Native American flute player. And so my checklist, I mean, I know this, this seems, you know, redundant, but you really do kind of need to check your stuff because we're going to get into that with when we talk about uh, expect the unexpected. But um, yeah, I, I have speakers. I make sure I take my speakers, my all my speakers, my amplifiers, and their cords. Uh, even if they are rechargeable, there's times when I've forgotten, you know, uh, that to charge it, and I do need the cord. Uh, make to make sure you have your auxiliary cords to connect to your music, you know, your headphone cords. Uh, make sure you have those. Um, make sure you have your microphones and the cords if that's what you're going to do and not use the wireless ones. If you're going to use wireless ones, make sure you have your batteries. Um, I always make sure I have my tablet, my phone, my charging cords, and whatever adapter I might need for my phone if I need to use the headphone auxiliary cord. Um, music stand, I just showed you. My tablet holder, my phone holder. Uh, my sheet music, if you still need sheet music, don't forget that. Uh, and I take, uh, just because I do sing at certain uh, places such as, you know, where health is an issue, I make sure I take, um, you know, my mask, my tissue, my hand sanitizer, water bottle, throat lozenges if you're singing. Um, my eyeglasses, nothing is worse if you're going to read music if you need and, and you just need reading glasses. Make sure you have an extra pair with your with your gig stuff here. Um, I also have extension cords and I'll try to make sure I have an extension cord with multi outlets on it because sometimes you don't know what you're going to get if you haven't been there to check things out. And I know there's some places where I need it anyway. Um, I also use shakers. So if you want to, you know, if you want to have your, your audience participation, I made these with some Easter eggs and just added some beans and glued them together. And so these are really cool. I bring these just in case if I get a pretty lively audience or if I see children in the audience, I bring these. Um, for Native American flute players, I also bring, I have my little cards. I have what's called prompt cards where I, excuse me, where um, I have like some chakra cards so they can kind of pick what key flute. So I'll make sure I put those cards in there depending on what flutes I want to bring, which key flutes I want to bring. Um, and I also will um, have some little other prompt cards. You can make your own or you can, you know, use a dice if you, that's what you want to do. If you want to include the audience, that's awesome. Maybe give it some variety. Um, I also make sure I bring my karaoke microphone mixer, just like I talked about, and my, my wireless mics that go with that. My song list and playlist, I make sure it's ready to go with my backing tracks. Uh, I use a lot of YouTube um, or, you know, Google, um, you can put it on your Google drive as well. Um, my chair and my stool, again, the chair is used more to hold my amplifier. 
Um, but you know, also depending if you're playing for a long time, I usually, my concerts usually go for a full hour. And because I do have some health issues, I do use, I also bring a, a foldable stool, which are pretty easy to come by as well. Here we go. Yeah. And they're super light. And I also hook both of these actually to the back of my, um, of my toolbox, my tool. Yeah. This little thing. So, um, and obviously my flute stand and my flutes and my flute carrying case. And like I said, I have a carrying case also for the, um, the microphone stand and the, uh, music stand. They both fit in this oblong, uh, holder or bag. Let's see. And so, and I saw whatever doesn't fit into the toolbox, I put on the sling. So I, and so my flutes are on the sling and so is my holder for my uh, stands. So I keep it pretty simple. Um, some setup checklists, stuff to maybe consider as well, is, you know, make sure you set up your flute stand and check the flute block. So make sure you're positioning your microphone where you need to. So for those of you who are new to this, um, you know, you, you probably want to have your flute, you know, probably uh, your block area or your flute needs to be, you know, pretty close to the microphone. At least that's what I find. Again, I'm a newbie at this too. But, you know, make sure that you've got it pretty close. Let's see here. No, but right here. I don't have this one right now. But So you have, you make sure that you've got your block ready to go and it's in the right place. And that when you play into it, the, the loudest is going to be right, probably if you play, the sound is going to come right from this area right here. Okay. All right, so keep it simple there. All right, um, what else? I set up my microphone, I set up my mic stands, I set up my tablet. I also, um, let's see, I also go ahead and have my YouTube playlist ready to go, like I said. I do a sound check. So again, it's important to get there a little early. That's another thing. Make sure you get there at least a, at least a half hour early. Um, and make sure you get your stuff set up at least a half hour early and you take care of business in the sense of make sure you go to the bathroom, you had your water, have a water bottle ready to go though as well in case you need one. Um, uh, make sure your backing tracks are ready to go. If you are playing at another venue, you know, you want to check all that with their, with their equipment, you know, um, and make sure, you know, each sound technician is a little different each, you know, so tread gently with, with when you're dealing with, uh, sound techs, um, because some may not be familiar with the native American flute. I always kind of give a very gentle hint because some places will have reverb on their, on their sound equipment. Some don't. I will say, is there any way, you know, do you guys have some reverb when I'm playing my flute? Can you guys like put it up a little bit if you're not going to, and hopefully you'll get a chance to do, um, you know, sound check with that. But, I always do try to say something in that regards, and if they don't have it, I've actually brought my own uh, my own little speaker here that does have the reverb on it, and kind of do it separately if it's a small enough venue. Um, and that's what I'm dealing with: is people who are playing for smaller venues. I'm not talking about professional people, um, you know, professional equipment and all that fun stuff. So that's awesome, but work up to that, you know. Um, let's see. Make sure you've connected everything. That's another thing you want to make sure everything's connected. And make sure you've got everything Bluetoothed and hot spotted if you're going to use Bluetooth uh, connections. And last but not least, because I do get paid when I go sing, I always make sure I come with an invoice or that. And we'll talk about business part as well. But I always come with an invoice as well. And usually I make sure I put that in with my music so I don't forget that. But that's something real important to not forget. Because if you're doing this to make a little extra money, then you want your talents and skills to be valued. So don't forget that. Okay. So that was what point number three, point number four is preparing your music. Again, the music that you choose to play has a lot to do with who your audience is and what the venue is like, what the setting is like. So take those things into consideration when you choose your music. Um, so let's go through a couple of different situations. So let's say you're doing a solo for a festival. So again, what kind of a festival is it? What kind of genre music do you think is going to be played there? 
because you don't want to show up to some kind of a reggae festival and play, I don't know, hard rock or Christian, contemporary Christian music. So, um, you know, put that into consideration when you're choosing your music. Uh, same like if you're singing for a church. Again, I sang at a Catholic church. There are certain hymns that can be sung or played during Mass. Be aware of what those formats are, what their music guidelines are. Know that ahead of time. Don't make assumptions because uh, that will get you a ticket to not coming back. Um, if you're playing for um, you know, seniors, again, try to do things that you think they like. Ask the, I, I become real good friends or have lots of communication with the activity coordinators at those places. They give me kind of a, a guide as to what kind of music to play. And I will, you know, and even with music, with uh, flute music, I don't play more than 20 minutes worth of music when I play uh, at a senior home or with people that I know aren't, let's say, flute aficionados. And when I play that music, I play several flutes. I take several of my flutes with me in case they went out. But I also to give variety. So I'll do some with backing tracks. I'll do some a cappella with just me playing. Some will be slow. Some will be fast. I'll do backing tracks with just drumming where I'll have different types of drumming. And by the way, I don't know if you know that, that when you look on YouTube, there is a little gear icon on the screen that you can change the, the, um, the speed, which will change the pitch. But if it's just drumming, it's not that big of a deal. But that is really cool because you could literally come up with three different songs with the same drumming backtrack that you find on, on uh, YouTube um, and change it and make three different songs out of that. Um, again, I also incorporate audience participation. Again, whether they I let them choose cards, prompt cards, or I have them start the beat, you know, or they can join with the beat. If I'm doing a drumming backing track, I have them do that too. Um, but I try to get them engaged, and that's how I pick my music. Um, Amazing Grace, oh my gosh, you know, they love that. And and so, and not just Amazing Grace, you know, pick songs. If, if you're at that skill level where you can learn some standards, um, you know, and do some cover songs, they really perk up. The audience will perk up to that if they're not quite 100%, I think, um, you know, Native American flute aficionados. So, uh, you know, I, and I'm gradually building my repertoire of Native American flute music. I'm still doing my standards and stuff. And so that's how I'm able to cover a full hour's worth when I do a concert right now. But yeah, just kind of keep it different. And then I use like, um, I use um, themes, you know, like uh, Fall's coming up and Halloween's coming up. So, you know, maybe think of songs on the Native American flute that have that kind of a tone. You know, we're talking Harvest festivals and the harvest moon and, and that kind of thing. Um, you know, I have a playlist on YouTube that I save. Um, I also, you know, but beware when you do use YouTube playlists, you can create your own. Um, but just be careful because there are a lot of ads. There's several things you can do to get around that. You can, you know, get a YouTube premium, I guess, is what, or some kind of a premium uh, subscription. I use what's called Brave brave.com and that's a web browser and that's free and I actually that's what I do I have my my I set my tablet uh, onto the brave website and I bring up my YouTube channel on there my YouTube chat uh, playlist on there and I am able to play all of my songs without any any ads um, and there's also and I'll put a I think I have a link for this as well there is a way that you can actually download the audio so if you're using backing tracks there is a way that you can download the audio um, from YouTube directly onto your PC. So if you feel comfortable and want to bring your PC and or later on save it on your Google Drive, then you can do that as well. Um, I have, I, I, my favorites when it comes to backing tracks for Native American flutes, I just uh, went to a uh, festival about a month or two ago with Jan Michael Light. What I think his name is. I should have that. Um, but he also has some wonderful backing tracks that I really like. Um, you can also use uh, karaoke backing tracks. Uh, put in the, the, the name of the song that you want to do and, um, and put in there, you know, whatever key you want to do. I do have a cheat sheet that you can 
look at. I'll see if I either have a, uh, it's called how to find the key of a song. So again, that might be a separate video as well, but there's ways that you can find the different keys of songs. Um, going back to the backing tracks, um, uh, what else? Uh, Johnny Lipford has some great backing tracks that you can purchase. Um, on um, YouTube for free, you can get Brent Adams is another great uh, instrumentalist that does some backing tracks and he's very familiar with the flute. Um, I think Tom Bailey, I think, is another one. And again, I'll have links for all this. But look on there, uh, Kalani Das is another one. Um, and there's also a link I'll put on here too where you can create your own uh, karaoke backing track. If you're just playing it for a small group or whatever, it's great to have those. But, and you can, you know, when you're on your playlist, you can you know, move them around and all that fun stuff. So I, that's what I do. I use strictly my, my karaoke playlist, or I'm sorry, my, my backing playlist is on YouTube. That's what I use. And I've been using that for at least three or four years. It has improved so much. So, but that's me. I mean, if you want to go ahead and you know, put things on your Google Drive or like I said, play it right from your computer. I just find it's just faster to have it all in one place. I pause it and, or it'll play, you know, correctly right next to my next song. So um, that's, that's pretty cool. I like that as well. All right, um, what else? Let's do point number five, expect the unexpected. Uh, I have had good, awesome, bad, and ugly things happen. Uh, I have had uh, audience issues as well. Um, so just come prepared, come prepared. Like I said, I think I've already touched on some of those things already about what can go wrong. Um, you know, again, it has a lot to do with your audience and your venue. So that's why the more you know about those two things, the chances of you not having anything unexpected happen will be less. Um, you know, here's some things maybe to think about. And also sometimes even while you're playing, certain things will happen that you have no control over. Um, you know, uh, here's some questions to consider. I have here, is the equipment plugged in correctly? I've done that. I've done that where I haven't, uh, you know, for instance, with my keyboard, there, I was playing for a service and I couldn't get it to play. We couldn't figure it out and it turned out I had not plugged the cord, my amp cord, into the amplifier all the way. Duh. You know, so those things you don't, and when you're in a hurry and if you don't give yourself enough time to prepare and set up, those are the kinds of things that can happen. Uh, another thing is everything fully charged. Like I said, a lot of my items here are uh, rechargeable and I try to remind myself to charge them up the night before and double check them before I leave. If I have gigs back to back, uh, that's harder for me to do. And that's why I always make sure I have the uh, electric cords with me if I have that option and that's available to me. Um, let's see, is the speaker and microphone switch turned on? I've done that too. And especially if you're gonna play the Native American flute, there's times like, why can't I get the microphone to work? Well, because you haven't turned on the button. And I've done that, so things to consider. <laughs> Uh, let's see what else. Is your microphone positioned correctly? That's a big one for Native American flutes as well. If you don't hear anything, is your microphone positioned correctly? Is your block positioned correctly? You know, has your flute wetted out? That's another one. And that's why I bring several flutes with me for that very reason. Because I know my flutes may possibly wet out. Um, or the weather is just making my flutes play, play a little wonky. I, I have 3D flutes that I use sometimes too for that very reason. Um, what else? Have you checked your settings on your equipment? Is your, vo is your volume up? Is, you know, is your volume up for your microphone? Do you have the button turned on? Is your Wi-Fi button pushed in? All of those things make a difference. And those are things you need to consider when you have no sound and something goes wrong and you don't hear anything. Um, what else? Um, internet. That is a big one. That's a big one. The internet. If you are dependent on the internet as I am, have some backup plans. Uh, my tablet does not have as strong an internet um, connection as my phone, but 99, 95% of the time, I can work off of my tablet and I just have it hot spotted to my, to my um, smartphone, to my phone, to my Samsung phone. And I do that because it's just easier for me to read that versus off my phone. 
Um, again, is your backing track ready to go? You know, make sure that there's a good Wi-Fi connection for that. You make sure your 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 files are ready to go if you're using you know a, a flash drive. Um, what else? Um, and also, there are times when nothing works. <laughs> well, the internet just no matter what you have, sometimes it just doesn't work. It's it's not going to work. And if you don't have anything backed up, and you don't have and that's happened to me sometimes when you don't have access to your music on the computer because of the internet, or maybe your computer's just not working. If all else fails, that's why I use my little shakers, because I figure worse comes to worse, we can have them play along with me, or you do your uh, your, your acapella music, and it draws a crowd in too. So it's kind of fun, and you make a game of it, and that's what I do when I mess up, or let's say if you mess up, and that's the thing. Practice your music. That's another thing. Make sure you practice your music. We're not perfect. I mean, we can practice till we're blue in the face, and mistakes are going to happen. And when that happens, you just smile and keep going. Most audiences there that you may perform as, especially if you're a beginner, they're pretty, most audiences are pretty forgiving. And especially since COVID and we've gone through all these Zoom classes, people are pretty forgiving. And so just have fun with it and play with your heart. And, um, and just remember that, you know, just remember that that's what it's about. And, and read your audience. You know, sometimes... I have to say there have been times to expect the unexpected when, you know, you, you have people just kind of start walking out. Okay, hard to know whether to take that personally or not. But, you know, you adjust. You kind of adjust your music. It's like, okay, a couple of people didn't like that song. Okay, maybe I need to go back to what I was playing before. So, again, expect the unexpected. Doesn't mean, uh, you know, you have to change everything. But go with the flow. That's what you kind of need to learn to do is just go with the flow. Um, all right, so I think that's pretty much for the expect the unexpected. And this part is kind of important, which is I have it as take care of business. And so um, I've been doing this off and on as a business for, you know, at least 30 years. And so a couple of little pointers that I would give, and, um, and again, this is for me. Uh, and then and my situations um, and from what I've seen and heard is when you're playing make it clear what your intention is and what your expectation is are you going to play and you're going to volunteer your time and if you're playing with others are they on board with that or are you expecting payment and if you are again if you're with other people in a group come up with with your standard fee or come up with what you're you're planning on on charging and make sure whoever is hosting the event knows what your intention is and what you're expecting for your time and your talents for being there um and one way of doing that is obviously communicating that beforehand and or also showing up with an invoice i always come with an invoice or I do my communication via email because then there's no uh, form uh, where anyone can say that, oh, I, I, I didn't understand that. When you've got it in email format, there's no way to say that. Um, also, uh, you know, um, make sure that, um, that there's some, that you're in a, in a position when you play that, um, your time is valued. So you are you are an employee if you're playing for, let's say, like a hospital like I do. Make sure you also have all the right uh, paperwork. I have to fill out a, a W-9 when I sing. Uh, find out that information. Find out if, if they need that information from you because they may use that as saying, well, you didn't fill this stuff out, so we're not going to pay you. Um, but again, if you're doing volunteer, you know, then uh, that's not so much of a thing. And in regards to volunteer versus paid as well, expectations are much different. Expectations are much different from you if you're volunteering. Um, you know, you can be a little more lax, I guess. Uh, but also remember that if you're going to be a little more lax and willy-nilly and play whatever you want without taking into consideration your audience and that type of thing, and you just want to play because you want to play what you want to play, then chances are you may not get called back. And or you won't, uh, you know, have any chance of building that business up where you could maybe in the future ask for payment 
which is what I've done now. I've built myself up to where now I'm asking for payment because some of these restaurants thought, you know, I could do it for, I do it for free and I did for a while. But as I got more experience and built up my, my repertoire and that type of thing, I did start asking because I knew, I found out that they're paying others. So I did ask. Um, another thing is, um, if you want to build your business, this is what I do. And this is how I, 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 I encourage people who are starting out, videotape yourself, learn some music, get your repertoire going, get a variety of music, learn your music and get comfortable enough to where maybe you can do some audio recordings or some video recordings and post them on YouTube. It is easy to do. It's free for you to post them. And it's free and easy for prospective clients and prospective gigs uh, to look them up and see what you do. Um, and so that is, to me, that's easy and inexpensive way of advertising. Um, I have business cards. I have, I printed my business cards up. I don't have one right here, but um, I, I did my business cards on um, uh, Vistaprint. I got, you know, I think 800 cards for 20 bucks, you know, or more than that, I don't remember. But easy, you know, just have those ready to go as well. Um, another thing, if you're looking for gigs and you're feeling that confidence level where you're thinking, I can do this and I want to get paid for it, or at least, you know, or, or for volunteer, um, start building up your references and your experiences. So I do... I have my own little resume that I have, and I have on there just, you know, very simple. And I have a little resume, I don't know if you can see it or not. Um, but my resume has my name, my phone number, my uh, email address, but I also have, I created myself a YouTube channel. And so you can add that on there and have your YouTube channel link on, on, on your resume. And if you want to email it, it's probably a little bit better if you can email your contact. Um, and that way they can go right to your page and you can, you know, depending on how you sort out your channel uh, by playlist or whatever, they have somewhere to look to see your music and hear your music, uh, whether it's on YouTube, Apple Music. I know a lot of you do your music on Apple and, and SoundCloud and all those lovely things. And I, I need to do more of that myself. But um, that's a great way to boost your um, potential to get gigs paid or or volunteer. Um what else? I think those are my two big things that I do. Um, and just, you know, and anywhere you've played, that is a reference. You know, put those down as well on your resume. You know, things that, uh, places that you've played at before. And maybe give them a heads up and let them know that, you know, you've put them down as your references. But and I, and as for fees, you know, every location is different. I'm in California. And um, my going rate right now, and it's 2020, after 2022, after COVID, and during COVID, I was actually busier than any other time. Um, I charge anywhere from eighty-five to one hundred dollars an hour, and it's just me. And I, you know, I carry just this stuff. Um, I actually was playing for a church where I was carrying my my fifty-pound piano, and they were charging. I was charging one hundred dollars for that, but I actually hurt myself. So make sure when you figure out what you want to charge, if that's where you're going to go. What is your, not only you sharing your music, but you are physically using some of your energy, whether it's, you know, while you're singing, but it takes time. It takes time to load this stuff up. And it, as the older you get, more of a toll it will take on your body. So try to find that happy balance. And it is beautiful to share our music. I love it. I have had some beautiful experiences, but I've also learned the hard way that I have to learn to say no for situations uh, where they're not good for me and my time and my efforts and my skills are not appreciated. Um, so that's just, you know, something to take into consideration if this is something you want to do and you want to do performances. It takes time. It does take some energy. Um, and it takes some planning. Um, but if you want to be successful at it, that is what you need to do. And again, I just really urge you to, um, you know, just take that into consideration and have that mutual respect for yourself and for whoever you're playing with. Make sure that there's communication and make sure you work smarter, not harder, and that you have fun and that you play for your soul and to share your gift 
and share that energy and soulfulness with each other. I hope you enjoyed this. I will go ahead and probably do a couple of different follow-up um, YouTube videos for this if for specific um, equipment and or, you know, uh, I'll probably go into a YouTube tutorial as to how I do my song choices and, and my uh, accompaniment and backups, if that backing tracks. But if you like this, please hit the like button, share it, um, and just let me know what any comments Positive comments are great. Constructive comments are great. I appreciate those. Um, so have a great day, and I hope you enjoyed this. Thanks for watching, and uh, take care, and enjoy, and happy, happy playing, happy fluting. Take care. Bye-bye.